Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigus. Welcome everyone back to the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're managing to get out fishing and perhaps catching some fish too. Um, I've been lucky to we've had a lift in water recently and it's been fun to swing some flies for salmon on my home river the tour i've not got lucky sadly um there haven't been many salmon around i think i've only heard stories of a couple caught um there was a sea trout caught from about three pound from where i fish uh, a couple of nights ago which was encouraging but it felt right the water was good but actually just being out on the water was enough and I really really enjoyed it I hadn't cast the double hand for quite some time so that was fun to do as these things happen and certainly on our river that the rivers drop back pretty quickly again um, so I was out with my friend Perry yesterday who's our artistic director of fly culture fishing a small stream uh, just dry flies just the two of us take it in turns fishing and it was one of those really cool days the fishing was tough the, the river it's a tributary of my home river and the The water levels were really low there. Super spooky fish. We had to be super stealthy. We did our best to do that. And we we caught some fish. We didn't um, catch hundreds and hundreds, but we did okay. And it was one of those really, really nice um, days. This one's being recorded, this podcast, on June the 24th. Um, The magazine uh, Fly Culture, the summer 2020 edition, is just starting to drop with subscribers and people who have bought it as well. Um, And it's been really exciting to see some of the feedback starting to appear in social media. It's one I'm really, really pleased with. And I'd like to thank all the contributors um, so much for some really cool, interesting, great articles. Um, And I hope if you bought a copy that you'll enjoy reading this one. Always let us know as well if you've enjoyed it or things we can do better. Um, I'm always looking to try and improve the magazine and make it better. But I think this one I'm really, really pleased with. So um, I love these moments when you do start to hear about the news about it. So it's an exciting time today. I'm really excited to be joined by Nick Thomas today. Um, He's a prolific fly tire, fly angler. He lives close to his home river, the Taff. Um, He makes fishing um, YouTube videos about fly tying, about his life on the river. Um, I first met him when I was running Eat Sleep Fish, and he wrote a number of articles for us there. And I was really pleased. I spoke to him early on when I thought of the concept of bringing a hard copy magazine to the marketplace fly culture um what he thought about it and whether he would be interested in um contributing and i was really pleased that he was i think he's written three or four art- uh, four articles now i think now um he's a th- one of the, a wonderful thinking angler who finds solutions for many situations so i thought it would be really really interesting to for our listeners to um, hear how he thinks about his fishing, how he approaches it. Some of the materials he ties with as well are fascinating. And um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his latest piece for fly culture, which revolves around how he looks for alternate materials for his fly dressing. So, Nick, I'm really pleased to have you as a guest on the podcast. How are you doing? Cheers, Pete. I'm pretty good. Uh, I got out fishing yesterday. It was hard. Uh, the river's coming down off a flood, and we've had we had really bad flooding uh, through the autumn, late autumn, and then some really worse than I've ever seen it in the winter. And I mean, the ta- the Taft's a very short river; it's only forty miles long. I think it's one of the, the steepest rivers in Britain. Uh, starts in the Brecon Beacons, and obviously it flows down through. Uh, the valleys and there's a lot of industrial heritage up there most of which has been cleaned up but I think some of it was exposed through these last floods I mean I I went down there fishing after it dropped and I remember standing in one of my favorite spots and just looking around being devastated and my my favorite sitting tree had completely disappeared Um, there's a lot of new beaches it's in one way, it's sad because a lot of things you remember have disappeared. And in another way, it's 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 good, really, because I've got a whole new river to learn in, in one respect. 
Um, Fantastic. And was there much erosion with that as well? Did you um, need banks or? Um, a lot of trees went along the edge of the banks. There's a lot of new, a lot of a couple of the really good gravel runs had disappeared, um, but all that gravel goes somewhere else. Um, so I was out yesterday fishing a bit. In fact, that I that I'd never fished before because I couldn't fish it um, before the bank. We have, we get a lot of uh, we have a lot of knotweed and uh, balsam, and in the summer it's it's like you really need a machete to get down to the bank. And there were a couple of places that were just deep water, and you could it it wasn't safe to wade before, but now there's gravel in those spots, and I fished one of them yesterday. I, I say maybe a a fifty meter stretch I'd never fished before, and I took two fish out of it. So. Yeah, there, there are pros and cons. The, the only thing people are a bit worried about now is they're up in the, the River Cunnan. Um, there's an old furnaceite plant there, which they remediated and cleaned up. But I think the you know, five and six metre floods above normal have washed stuff in that was deemed to be safe before. Um, so if, if we had, you know, last year, if we had a minor flood, the river would clear within a couple of days now it's taking three or four days to clear um we'll have to see if the nrw do anything about it but we'll wait and see but yeah, yeah the fishing's it's hard i mean the, the, the taff is not it's the bit i fish is it's not an easy river i know a lot of people try it and basically give up um I mean, I, I can go down there usually when I fish it, the stretches I fish, and rarely do I see another angler um, or rarely see another person. It's a bit different these days with uh, lockdown and so on because there's a lot of people, because in, in Wales we're still restricted to five miles or local travel, whatever that is. Um, there's a lot of people using it, well, rightly, as a resource and going down and sitting in the sun on the gravel. Um, and you just, I got used to it now. Um, you just have to be careful that somebody doesn't walk behind you on your back cast. But other yeah. than that, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a similar sort of case. I fished uh, with a friend on the X, and it was like spring break. Yeah. And uh, it was two or three weeks ago. I can't remember where it was. And exactly the same, and there were kids – you know, having a swim around and so, and you just got to let it go, haven't you? There's no, you know, it yeah. is I, it's I, a release, release for people. They can get out, they can go do stuff, and you know, if it's that, that's fine right now, isn't it? Yeah, I do. I do worry sometimes because you know, kids swim in it, and it's it's not, you know, it's not. I wouldn't call it a safe river to swim in, and people go in paddling in bare feet. I mean, as I said, it is an industrial river. There's loads of stuff on the on the bottom that you don't want to stand on in bare feet. Um, but yeah, it's very, it's a lot busier than it used to be. The, uh, the skinny, I haven't seen the skinny dipping lady for a while. I think she's retreated. She used to go, <laughs> I, I came across, I think I put her in one of my articles. I came across her a couple of times and early in the morning in a quiet band, but she was quite unperturbed swimming around, totally nude. And she just got out, wished we good morning and went off. But, so there's a few characters down there. But, uh, Lovely. And how cl how close are you to the river, Nick? Can you walk there from home? I, <laughs> it, it's a mile. So, I, yeah, I could walk. It's a steep hill. And at the end of the day, particularly in weather like this, walk, the prospect of walking up a steep hill in waders and heavy boots is not good. So, yeah, generally, I, I just pop down in the car. Mm. Um, and and I know from your videos and from some of the writing that you've done for us as well, it's a special river for you. You fish that a lot, don't you? There's you do a lot of days down there. Yeah, I mean, and again, under normal circumstances, but at the moment I'm fishing well, one day a week on average, usually an early morning session. Um, I go the occasional evening. Um, the fishing probably like most rivers is probably better at dusk but if i'm going to film i need the light so i tend to go in the early morning and catch the the early morning before the sun hits the river but uh yeah no about now i'd fish it maybe yeah about once a week um pre all of this 
I would be fishing it twice a week, every week throughout the year. Um, it, it's where I, it's where I do most of my fishing. I'll take, you know, I'm definitely through the winter. That's where I fish. In the summer, I'll I'll take a, the odd session and go after carp or go and fish on the YNS passports. Um, but that even that that's limited now because of the travel distances. I'll maybe fish the higher uh, bits of the TAF on a day, when I can get a day ticket. Um, and again, under normal circumstances, you know, I'd be down the Gower or Pembrokeshire after bass or pollock or something. But right now, I mean, I'm I'm lucky, really, to be honest. I've got that river a mile away, and the the stretch I fish is probably is only two to three miles long, and a lot of that isn't isn't fishing water or it's not accessible. So the bits I fish are, if you add them up, probably less than a mile. But it's really within that mile. There's a whole range of water. It just makes it. So interesting. And as I said before, because it's changed so much, I am exploring and finding new areas and different ways to fish them out of the, the armory you have, whether it's dry or dew or whatever. I've even fished a streamer this year, which I haven't done for a long time. They're a hot topic again, aren't they? They're coming coming into vogue. Yeah, again, they? yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't use them a lot. I, I tied a few. Again, it's something that makes me think. If I was going to tie a streamer, how am I going to tie a streamer and make it different? Because that, you know, we'll probably touch on fly tying a bit later. But that that's essentially what I try and do. That you know, my my fly boxes are really pretty simple. Um, because I I tie for interest. I tie because it makes my brain think, and it's it's how my brain works. It's kind of what I used to do in my job before I retired. Um, but I try and think of stuff that's different because it's more interesting to tie. Um, yeah, I could tie a box full of pheasant tails, and I'd probably catch the same amount of fish. Maybe not maybe less fish, but I could do that. But, yeah, it's fine. And, you know, same for making videos. But there's The world doesn't need another video on how to tie a PTN. So I try and do something different. And it's interesting, but like you say, we'll come on to the fly tying at some stage. Um, it was interesting you talked about that mile of river, though, and I don't know if it comes as I get older that my inclination to want to travel – <laughs> is coming less and less yeah. and my home river um is similar that it has everything that i want it doesn't have grayling that's the only very slight yeah, downside sure. but i found some fishing that i can grayling fish now that's not a million miles away um but i find i have everything i want there and and so my need to want to travel is becoming less Unless that doesn't mean to say I don't enjoy those trips when I do them. And obviously, given the circumstances we've had, we've not done one for a while now. I've not not traveled. But um, it, it's interesting. Do you think that comes with maturity? Or do you think it is just a passion that burns strong for your home water? Um, <laughs> I think it's a mixture of things. Um, age being one of them, to be honest, for me. I mean, just yeah. So I, you know, I, I worked as a I worked as an R and D scientist in a big healthcare company for thirty years, and I I retired early because I could. And when I retired, I had like I don't know, half a million air miles, so I could go anywhere in the world, business class, no trouble at all. I have no desire to. Yes, I I have literally no desire for long haul flights anymore. I did I I've done my share of long haul flights during my working career, so yeah, you know, and I've been a lot of places. I, the only place I I guess I regret I've never been is New Zealand, but I couldn't face going there now. So yeah, I mean my my home water. If I could not never fish anywhere else. I would not be devastated. I probably wouldn't be unhappy. It, yeah, like you. It's and I do have grayling and uh, chub 
and barbel and sea trout. So, yeah, um, it's almost if you had to design your ideal fishing place, you know, easy access, get there any time, you know, fish it for an hour, fish it for eight hours, fish a whole range of different techniques for different species, either by accident or by design. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, you, you, you have the knowledge that you could, you know, under, when, under normal circumstances, you'd go, go and fish somewhere else or in theory, anywhere else you wanted to. Um, you know, I've, I've been to Alaska. I've been to BC. Uh, I've been to Iceland a couple of times. I, I probably, I probably go back to Iceland maybe because it's, it's a two hour flight, not a, 12 hour flight but it's 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 not just the length of the flying it's all the hassle of airports and all that you know so you can get a fishing fix in an hour down the river here five minute drive get your waders on fishing hour and a half two hours and you're done or you want to go you know 12 hour flight so on and so on for some different fishing and Fishing for me is is peace and tranquility and thinking. I think I've said before, you know, a fly rod in your hand is an excuse to stand in the middle of a river without people calling the police and thinking you're a nutter. Yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Um, and it's it's something that I can link to the other stuff I do: the writing, the fishing videos, the fly tying. It's it's all stuff that keeps my brain alive and my essentially my brain works the same way now as it did when i was working i mean basically when i was working i was paid to write scientific papers and write patents um and that means taking photographs drawing diagrams um going to conferences you know preparing presentations, all the graphics and stuff like that. That's what I did in my day job. And it's what I do now. You know, I'm sitting here in my office talking to my you on my computer, and that's where I do all my stuff. My fly tying bench is right next to me. My video equipment's all on the shelves behind me. And so, yeah, that's it keeps your brain going. Mm. Mm. Um, lots, of, lots of people need something to keep their brain going but I think that the great thing about fly fishing is that it keeps your brain going but it also de-stresses you and calms you from those incidents that occur in everybody's life where you need that sort of stuff mm. that's really interesting there's some points there I was thinking about and you said you know fishing for an hour and a half two hours and I find now that's about right and yesterday was a perfect example for me that you know we fished together um perry and i and we spent more time drinking coffee indoors talking about life talking about fishing and that equally is part of it as well the company of a good friend sometimes i've been and i think i've said on these before when i've been uh a guide i've been used to fishing with someone next to me i'm actually really enjoying fishing on my own i take the dog with me and i chat to the dog um or if i'm salmon fishing it's usually with my wife but i've enjoyed those moments to actually fish alone and really enjoy those but i found that i've not needed to go for a whole day and fish for 12 hours a couple of hours is fine and the other thing you mentioned was about fishing the evening I'm pretty similar. I have, and I'm probably going to fish either this evening or tomorrow evening, but I found that the fishing has been really good this year. Um, and the morning, I love the morning. It's a time when it almost feels to me like the day belongs to me for a short time. Yeah. When there's nobody about, I was out walking the dog at half past six this morning. There was no one around and it almost feels as though it's yours for a bit the day. And that's really enjoyable. So I've enjoyed fishing more morning than evening, although I probably will do some more evening stuff, but I don't do a whole lot of it. And I think part of that is probably having again been a guide that, you know, I fish till six o'clock with people, come home. Sometimes I'll go out if it looks as though it's going to be epic, or Emma says, Look, I'm feeling it for salmon, let's go. And it's probably driven by that. But it's interesting that you say that because I feel very similar to you that I'm going fishing for a couple of hours and it's not me picking the best time. 
it's just I fancy going for a couple of hours now. Is that how you think of it in that sense as well? It's not yeah, yeah. no time. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I yeah, if if I wanted to catch fish, if that was the primary aim, then I then I'd leave the house at eight o'clock, be down there and fish from say half past eight till I couldn't see a fly anymore. But it's not about it's not all about catching fish. Um, and I think a lot of, I mean, everybody, I guess most people who fly fish or, or do any sort of fishing, they go through the stage where it's about catching fish. Um, and hopefully they get to the stage where they realize that it's, it's not about catching fish. It is about standing in the river with something in your hand and not being hailed by the police. Or as you say, going out there and it being quiet the sun just coming up, low light, bird song, and no sound or very mm. little sound. Um, mm. And it and it's yeah, it's it's. I think it it continues. It continues the peace of sleeping, getting up, having breakfast, or just a cup of coffee, going fishing, quiet, and then be back home for the rest of the day with the other stuff that, you know, cutting the grass, whatever else that needs to be done in the day. I got painting over wall to do later today. But, um, yeah. And then hopefully I'll, once I've painted that wall, I'll be down the river, but not with the, not with the rod, but with the camera. And I'll be shooting the, the bits of video that go into my, uh, fly time or fishing films that aren't, that I don't shoot on the day. Cause on the day I shoot, yeah, any, anything with me, you know, walking or fishing or returning a fish is all shot with a small waterproof camera, which, you know, is fine and the quality is good for what I use it. Um, but the other stuff, you know, with different lenses and so on, um, what video people would call B-roll, it's the, the intermittent footage. That's all shot separately on a, on a DSLR. Um, so, I'll, yeah, I'll, again, I'll do that for... Yeah, you know, a couple of hours later this afternoon, just pop down. I've got a couple of locations in in mind and a couple of shots I'd like to have, and I just collect those shots, and then they all get edited together. When you know, it's about again, it's a it's the same as writing. It's about telling a story, but without words. It's images and music and ambient, and that's again what. Um, I mean, when I started doing that, it, it's a. I like to learn how to do different things and try and learn how to do things well, not just, oh, that'll do. Because, I mean, with the best will of the world, you know, we, there's an awful lot of uh, poor, shall I say, being charitable fishing stuff on YouTube. Um, you know, I, I don't consider strapping a GoPro to your chest and then uploading 20 minutes of unedited footage particularly edifying but there's having said that there's lots of really you know professional quality footage and film I, footage films um i don't know if you've ever watched carpe diem a couple of swedish guys who who make uh, fishing videos but they you know that's really professionally shot mm. They, they do have the advantage of them being two of them. So one can be behind the camera while the other's fishing. Whereas I have to, I have to set mine up on a tripod and, um, hope that I'm in the frame while I'm fishing. I had, <laughs> I had a great one yesterday. I was, I was fishing in one of these new spots and there was a nice handy log for me to put the tripod and the camera on. So I fished, caught a fish, released it went back to the camera, looked at the video. I wasn't in the frame. It was just five yeah, minutes of empty, okay. vivid, empty river. So, you know, <laughs> I, I can reshoot the fishing shot, but I can't re reshoot the fish. Uh, so, yeah, again, it, <laughs> in one respect, moments like that real make you realise that you're, you're doing it, the fishing part, to de-stress and, and don't add to it by getting stressed over making a video. It's not worth it. You know, you'll get the shot in the end. 
Yeah. While you mentioned that video, I don't know if you've seen, and I've mentioned elsewhere, um, some videos by Chase and Amy Barty. Have you seen those? And it's it's called Trout in a Camper Van or something like that. No, I don't recall them. Um, they're just really, really good. And they're about, they live in Massachusetts and they drive, one of them's they drive to Maine and fish for brook trout. Yeah. They go to Montana and and fish out there. But it is, like you say, it's not just about the fish. Yeah. And they're just beautifully, beautifully shot. And really, for me, encapsulate what fishing's about. And I'd really recommend if people can find those. Um, they're worth a look as well. They're beautifully, beautifully shot. And they are, that's what they do sort of thing. Um, and they're beautiful films, and um, for me, it's what it's all about. But what I wanted to say first off, as well as as uh, I always do, I go off topic, and we we go down interesting routes. But I'd like to say a huge thank you to you for being such a supporter of fly culture um, and the articles you've written. I think this one that's appearing in the latest one is your fourth. And this sort of sums up what you've just been saying, that we've had poetry from you. We've had a piece about traveling when you were younger to be alone. We've had um, about 100 days on the river with some geology stuff in there as well. And then this one is called Fly Couture. And it's about your fly tying and sourcing materials. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that piece that you wrote, um, this latest one, how it came about and perhaps um, a little bit about your um, searching for different materials to explore fly dressing and, and where, where that's taken you. Yeah, I mean, fly could, in, in one respect, the article's kind of about my fly tying life. Um, I mean, I, I, started, I started fishing when I was, I guess, about eight years old. So my father bought a boat, and then one day he came home with a, a spinning rod and a couple of tobies, and uh, so we could go fishing from the boat. And uh, we went out on on Loch Goyle, which is one of the, the fields, if, well, they are fields off the Clyde, and caught some mackerel. And that was it for me, fishing, done. Um, fly fishing came a couple of years, no, probably I was, 12 or 13, we were up in, staying up in a hotel in Loch Inver in Sutherland. And it was, it was at that time, it was what, you know, a typical Scottish fishing hotel. There was a big tray in the, in the entrance hall and people put their catch of the day in there. Um, and I don't know if, you, if you've ever been up to Sutherland and Acid, but there, there's basically more trout locks there than you can see. You know, you just look across and everything's sparkling blue. So one evening, a guy who was uh, a fly fisherman who was staying in the hotel offered to take my father and I out. So we went to a little lock and near the hotel. Uh, and I caught my first fly caught trout. And that was it, really. I, I liked the spinning. And I always, I always did, um, as I was growing up and through a teenager and, and into my 20s, all types of fishing. Um, but fly is always the... Uh, the fundamental thing for me. So um, probably when I was about 15, I started to tie my own flies. Um, I didn't have a vice, but I borrowed a, a pair of pliers from my father and clamped them in a woodworking vice. Thread in my fingers. Um, there was a, a fishing shop in Glasgow. I, I lived in Scotland at the time. Fishing shop in Glasgow, I used to visit and buy a few, obviously buy hooks and bit of peacock hurl, a few feathers and stuff. And I tied up some very scruffy flies. Um, and we, we had a, a, the River Grife ran through the village where we lived, and that had trout and grayling in it. So I would fish that. Um, but I didn't, you know, in those days, if you wanted materials, obviously you, you had a mail order catalogue, a paper one, and you wrote off or you went to a fishing shop. Um, so I started to basically improvise at that stage my mother sewed a lot so i'd steal bits of uh, embroidery thread to make tags on flies and so on um and I, I took it from there but i think it was always even from that stage it was make stuff um with what you had or what you could improvise with and that's how basically how my fly tying developed um i mean i, I kind of 
stayed with those flies for well, 30 years or so, those types of scruffy spiders, pearl on a hook, wool, stuff like that. Um, and then I think probably 15 years ago or so, I was, again, doing the same thing, rummaging around in the sewing basket. My wife's this one time instead of my mother's. Um, and I, she had some organza ribbon in there. And it was it was all frayed at the end where it had been cut and battered about in a box. And I just picked apart and bits started to come out. So the long fibers out of the middle. And then I cut it and I started to, to play about with it. And I, that's how I, I guess, how I started into synthetic materials. The other thing that happened is um, I have now developed an allergy to lots of natural materials. So if I, some I can still use, I can still use pheasant tail, but hair's ear, I just literally start sneezing, my eyes water, I come in out in a rash. I, I had to clear out my whole kit and caboodle and throw all, a lot of stuff out. So I can, I basically, where I can, I'll use a synthetic. Um, the flies last a hell of a lot longer. So I very rarely retire a fly now. I either, well, the only reason I'll retire it is because I can't sharpen the hooks anymore uh, or I lose it. Um, but yeah, Dorganza is, is my, it's my desert island material. If you said you can only tie with one thing now, forever, that's it. So coming back to that, if I, somebody said you can only fish the taff and you can only fish with organza flies, I'd say fine, no problem at all. <laughs> yeah, let me at it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for, for people that are not familiar with organza, it, it's basically a, it's a nylon ribbon made out of very fine fibres, like human hair thickness. It's like a ladder. It's got thick woven edges and cross fibers and then long fibers which run up the length. So basically, if you cut one edge of the ribbon off and pull out the long fibers, you have essentially a, a synthetic hackle. So you can cut that short and wind it like a, a hurl, or you can wind it long, or you can wind it onto a fly and then trim it. Because unlike a unlike a feather hackle, the filaments are the same length. So it doesn't matter what length you cut it to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think about, about when I started using it, I was using it, I guess, like, I mean, lots of people use it. Um, the typical use is they cut it, they wrap a dubbing body, and then they rib with organza because it, it strengthens the body, it sparkles it looks like and if you say you do a, a cream or ganza over a dark dubbing it looks like gills and gives you segmentation on a nymph um so yeah i i, I think I, I wrote about 10 11 years ago i wrote an article for fly tying and fly fishing about using organza that's what i was doing at the time just using it as a, an adjunct to other materials but over the years i've yeah, but basically, the more you experiment with things, the more you find out how you can use it. And now, you know, I do a lot of my flies, I just use organza, nothing else. I mean, or or I use it, as I say, with one other material. Um, I mean, it, it's really flexible. You, you know, as I said, you, it has long fibers which run up the middle. You can strip those out. They make brilliant tails for nymphs, or you can add them to uh, a poly yarn wing. So you can have a, a, a blue done poly yarn wing and then black or organza fibers make look like wings, uh, veins on the wings. Um, you can pull the whole ribbon over uh, a fly and make a thorax cover. Um, you can take the, cre the pale stuff and shade it with a, a marker pen and wind it on to make legs. Um, I think I've done pretty uh, – you can even take the ends and, and melt them in a, in a lighter flame, and like the same way you melt, melt mono and make eyes. So I've, you know, I've tied lots of patterns with just organza. Like I, I did one a couple of months ago um, that's called um, Look Like Fish Food. And – it does. It looks like fish food. And if you tie it on a size uh, eight 
say hook in brown cream, it's a mayfly nymph. If you say, tie on a 14 or a 16 in black and white, it's a midge. And those are the types of flies that, you know, I have rows of in my boxes, as well as in the corners, some of the more complicated ones I tie. Um, and, yeah, I'm, the one I was fishing yesterday, for example, I, I've never written about it or done a video on it because uh, it's so simple. Uh, it's called an ITI, which stands for Is That It? Um, and that, that's basically uh, some brown organza fibers stripped out and tied in as a tail. The brown organza wound up the hook to a bead, and then you give it a haircut with a pair of scissors and basically trim it down either to a, a carrot shape or trim all the, the uh, abdomen off and leave the thorax. And, yeah, it catches as pretty much as well as any other pattern I use. Um, I, I might do a video on it. I might not. It seems a bit of a fraud to do a video on something that's so simple. <laughs> it's really interesting listening to you um, talk about that and the development of the flies. Um, do you have situations where you go, right, okay, I'm going to take this one to the river and it doesn't work, but you persevere with it? Or do, is there a time, have there been situations where some that you've tied you thought would work didn't actually play out the way that you thought or do you just sort of stick with them and then bring them into play how, how does that process work for you um i think it i think it depends on the type of fly um i mean dry, dry flies are, are a particular example um the, i mean the uh, the prime requirement for a dry fly is that it floats um so yeah you can tie a very nice looking dry fly and if it don't float then it's not gonna it'll fail then um generally i could pretty well figure out from the materials i use whether it's going to float or not the, the key thing is if i'm going to use it in a duo so it's not just going to float itself it's got to float um a nymph underneath so i i have tied flies and and you know i would i always tie prototypes couple of different prototypes and then take them to try. I mean, so, you know, sometimes they, sometimes particularly with dry flies, they don't cast very well. They're windmill or they're prone to tangle or they just don't sit right. You know, you make a modification or whatever. Um, or sometimes um, you you don't put enough flotation on them. So they're, they're okay. I, I don't like dry flies that, um in my box that i can only use as dry i like to have them that i can use as a, in a duo and that generally for me means tying them on a jig hook so i can use them in a jig duo um just because it's quicker to adjust the depth then um so yeah for dry flies there's often a bit of back and forth about how much um flotation you put into them um and generally, for all of my dry flies now are, are tied with poly, poly yarn. Um, I, I gave up. I, I'll use deer hair occasionally, but that means tying a fly that makes me itch. So if I really want to do it, I'll do it. Um, CDC I don't bother with anymore. It's, I just, it's not worth the effort of uh, either tying it or you know treating it. I like something that I can put gink on at the beginning of the day put a nymph underneath it and it stays on the surface or and well the, the other thing for me is that if it goes under and i pull it it comes back up if it goes under and that's it for me that's a fail in terms of a, a design um for nymphs um i'll for a new fly i'll yeah i'll if I don't catch with it the first time out, I'll give it a couple of goes because I know that I can take one of my best flies on a given day and not catch anything on it. So you have to give it a you have to give a new design a fair crack of the whip. Um, but generally, I I feel it kind of as I was alluding to before about the 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 simplicity of most of the patterns in my box. I 
I very rarely change a fly during the day unless I lose it. So, you know, what I had on yesterday caught me fish. I'd leave it on. If I were, even if I wasn't catching fish, I'd leave it on. I, I'd move because I, generally I believe that if uh, if you've got a pattern on, you're in a place where you have caught fish before and you're not catching, it's either because if you're fitting, say, a geo, the, the length from the dry to the nymph is too long or too short, generally too short if you're not catching, or the nymph isn't heavy enough, so it's not sinking fast enough and drifting right. So if I, if I do change a fly, I'll change it either up or down weight. So I might change from a two and a half to a three mil or a three and a half mil tungsten or or down, depending on which one I've got on at the time. And the one I the one I replace it with may be the same pattern or something that looks similar. I, I really don't worry about that. I'm just I'm picking the bead size. Yeah. Um and that's it. Um I very rarely change the thickness of my tippet either. I'll I mean on, on the TAF I'm either fishing four or five pound. Basically, because um, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, I, w- I wouldn't. I mean, I've landed um, chub over seven pounds. I know that because I weighed it. Um, trout, I don't weigh, but you know, I'd, whatever a twenty-six inch trout is, that on a you know, five pound, um, uh, and I've had barbel, but they've. The only barbel I've had on that tippet came off of its own accord. Um, but I, I wouldn't go fishing for barbel without gear. But now I wouldn't go finer than four, and mostly I fish five all the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I I tend to I tend when I go down and tackle up. If I've had a good session the time before, I'll put the same flies on. I don't agonize over my box very much. And I, there's not, you know, my my small summer box, there's that not that many patterns in there. They're in there in different sizes and different weights. So that's what I change. I see occasionally I meet anglers who, you know, they're, they're changing their flies every 10 minutes, which means their flies are not in the water, so they're going to catch less. Basically, my philosophy is in, if it's in the water and you're not catching – then the fish either aren't there at all or they're not going to take anything that you put in. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I can v- remember very, very few occasions where I've saved fish for an hour, caught nothing, changed the fly, and then within a short period of time caught something with, you know, a fly that was the same weight but a different pattern. And... Um, you, know, you you can't do controlled experiments. I mean, I'm a scientist. You would do controlled experiments. You can't do controlled experiments in fly fishing. So those things happen. And um, people tend to you know, put a lot of store on a particular aspect of a fly. That's why, you know, why people perhaps agonize over trying to get Chadwick's wool to tie a killer bug. I'm not going to make any difference. And it's just... It's you know was what are the chances you know that Sawyer picked on that particular shade of wool as being the only one in the world that would make a killer bug as effective? Hmm. And it, it's the same as you know it's the same with uh, pheasant tail, you know the pheasant tail nymph of which there are hundreds of varieties now, all equally effective if you fish them right. Yeah. As are as are most flies. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And I think what you said, and I'm 100% in agreement with, is changing length of dropper or weight of fly um, and being aware of needing to make those changes, um, I think is really, really important. One of the things I wanted to ask you while we were talking about this is that, you know, to me, a fish is shortening a an aspect of a fly or changing an aspect of a fly i'm coming to the conclusion it's not going to be a life-changing difference like you say that window of a fish seeing that fly is so small and so quick 
that I'm not convinced micro changes to a fly would make the difference between you catching it and not catching it. I don't know what you think about that. No, I, I agree totally. Um, I mean, yeah, most most of the water I I fish now, they've probably got yeah, they've got less than a second to make up their mind, um, and so yeah, it's long. Basically, I agree. the The thing is having getting the depth right, and the depth is a combination of the diameter of the tippet, the weight of the nymph the hydrodynamic profile of the nymph, whether it's slim or bushy, how fast it sinks. Um, and, and knowing when when to change that. Um, so, for example, yeah, I was out, as I say, again yesterday, I was fishing the, exactly the same spot at one stage as I was fishing the week before. And But we'd had some rain through the week, so I reckon the river was running... 10 to 12 inches higher. So I started off with the same rig that I'd used the week before. Um, nothing. So I put another 15 inches on the tippet, and that's when I started to pick up fish. Um, so it was it was a combination of it was running a little faster, and the water I was fishing was a little deeper. I mean, the water, the, the one run that I was fishing, one of my favorites, and it's probably you're fishing close against the far bank and standing on sloping gravel, which slopes down into a run. So it's probably five feet deep where your where your dry fly is actually running with the, the nymph underneath. So you can fish five foot uh, or a bit longer, um, and that generally works. But yesterday it needed another foot, 18 inches, and that did make the difference. Um, same way to fly. It was just it was just the extra length. Had it had it been running a bit harder, I would have probably gone up from a I was fishing a three mil tungsten. I would have gone up to a, a three and a half. But other than that, um sometimes sometimes changing the bead colour makes a difference, but I I'm still not hundred percent convinced. I'll I'll always go with start with a black or just a, a natural tungsten. But I'll have gold or copper on hand. Um, you know, there's the old adage of uh, dull day, dull fly, bright day. Whether that makes any difference or not, I don't know. I think you just go with, again, it, it's supposed to be relaxing. So staring at a fly box for 10 minutes and rummaging around in desperation in the corners, it, it's not it's not calming. It's, it's you know, have... It's about confidence, and I think that's uh, what I try and give people when I design flies and make videos. Here's a fly that is not overly complicated to tie. Um, it uses materials that are readily available and not, you know, nothing esoteric, and and you can tie it reasonably easy. I, I, to be honest, I don't like. Um, it sounds strange, but I, I actually don't like tying flies in front of a camera. It's, it's completely different. And my hands, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of editing goes into making it. I mean, and that's, you know, the, the reason I, I won't tie complicated patterns, because with the best will in the world, I'm, I'm not Davy McFarlane or Barry Old Clark. You know, I, I, don't have the experience or the natural talent to tie flies that well. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't enjoy the actual aspect of tying a fly with a camera pointing at me. Uh, once it's done, then the rest of making that fly tying video is, is, is a joy. You know, the whole aspect, the, the, the graphics, the, the macro photography of the flies, um, and then adding in the, the fishing video at the end. It's, it's trying to make a, a complete package that's, well, it's a bit like you doing fly culture. You differentiate it and you, with a high-quality thing that is different to what the majority of stuff out there. 
And same with fish, you know, same as I said with fishing videos. And there's a, there are lots of fishing video, uh, fly time videos on YouTube, where are, which are extremely good. The two guys that I've just mentioned, obviously, and others. And there are some terrible ones. Again, you know, just to put propping your iPhone up in front of your vice and tying. I don't think, well, okay, if you want to do it, fine. Um, but it's not what I enjoy doing. Um, yeah. I, yeah. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll, if, if David McPhail puts up a video, I will watch it, of course. And if Barry puts up a video, I will watch it, of course. Those are the only two I watch. Um, I'll, maybe occasionally I'll look at something else. If, if it's got uh, a particularly, if I think the fly is different, I'll watch it. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah, you, you get you get to know what you like doing and what you don't want to do. Same as, you know, reading magazines. I don't read fly culture is the only thing I read now. Um, it's just, I get it. I don't know whether it's, it's a stage in life or a stage in experience. There's no point in reading a magazine if it's not, if you're not going to learn anything and it's not going to give you any pleasure. And I think we had this discussion years ago when you were talking about, thinking about setting fly culture up. And, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very happy for you and for me because it gives me an opportunity to write stuff for that I, to be honest, if I wrote it, it wouldn't go anywhere. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's the really, the, I guess, again, as I said before, the satisfying thing for me is doing something that makes my brain work learn new things and think and come up with something at the end of the day that you're happy with. Mm. Yeah. Not just something that's, Oh, that'll do. It's, it's done. I mean, so, some of the stuff I write takes a long time. I, you know, you mentioned poetry, the, the beyond the bridge poem I did. I think that took a year to write and it's not very long. But I got pages and pages of, of notebook stuff that went into that. I mean, it was it was kind of painful to write for what was going on at the time. Um, but then, you know, that was that was complete. And then the image that's on the the opposite page, which is a Photoshop composite, that was learning new stuff to do. And similarly with the um, I can't remember which issue it is. In but the the double page spread the well the chemistry lesson one and that, so that took that took days and days and days of learning how to do what is a full thirty image composite in Photoshop but then make it look real that's it's not just a whole load of stuff piled on top of each other but everything is blended all the lighting is blended. Or the like the old book that's in it is is aged by splatter brushing it in Photoshop, stuff like that. But it it's learning new stuff and how to make it better. Whether that's standing in the river, tying flies, making videos, or writing. Yeah. Which do you prefer? Uh, I don't. I don't have a preference. Um, I. I've settled on those things. I mean, writing, you have to be in the mood. Um, so often a, a piece, as I said, so Beyond the Bridge took me a year. Um, another article, you know, I can, well, Fly, Fly Couture took me, oh, I don't, I, I don't know how long it took. I don't, hold on. I don't know how long that, that took to write um, because you basically I jot things down in notebooks or I write things on a, on a draft in on the computer and then I come back to it. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, all the stuff is there and you have different things you want to say. And then it's just a question of coming back to it. And sometimes you're in the mood, sometimes you're not. And then all of a sudden it just kind of coalesces together into one piece. Um, yeah, so writing I enjoy. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy all of them equally. Right, writing is different because you obviously you need to have something that you want to write about. Um, I guess fly tying is the same because, as I said before, I, I won't, you know, I need to, I need an idea for something new. Because if, if it's, if it's, if there isn't something new in a fly, either a new material, a new way of using a material, or just simplifying something down, um, I won't do it. So, I, again, I, I I said it, it's very much like I was in work. Um, and I, I used to, part, part of my, well, the main part of my job was inventing ways of doing things faster or better or cheaper, right, and then writing the patterns for them. Um, and once you get into that mindset of R&D science, you, you, you cannot make an idea come. So a lot of the things I invented in work, the ideas would come to me in the shower or in a, or in a treadmill on the gym or even on the river. I would think about something that wasn't fly fishing, but it was work. Hmm. Nowadays, it's the same thing. You can't – I will just get an idea of, oh, can I do that with organza or what if I you know, put those two, two materials together in a different way? And that can come to me at any time. Um, and I'll I will run with it, and it's the same with writing. I will have a an idea for a, a story, or a, a poem, or or whatever, and it I may produce that fairly rapidly, or it just sits around and moles around in my brain for a while, and then comes out. Um, I mean, the the, the first article I I uh, wrote for Fly Culture. Uh, the wandering in the wilds one. That I type more or less straight off. Um, other ones, yeah, the, some of the others have taken quite a bit longer. I think it's because um, there are a lot of things you want to say, but it's saying them concisely and in the right order with the right number of words, so you don't end up with a 10,000-word polemic on this is what I like to do type of stuff. And, and, you... and also not, you know, not a technical article. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's know, an interesting when... point you make in that being in the mood for it and when you can go for a walk or go fishing or – and I'm similar that – I'll walk the dog in the morning, suddenly come back and say to Emma, actually, I've had an idea and I, I've not been, and it's a conscious effort not to write for the magazine, but I put um, articles on Facebook, short little pieces that come really quickly and you find there are moments when things flow and like you say, sometimes there may be times where you have to think about things, sketch things down, write, write things down and it is an interesting process, isn't it? The writing process about being in that right, even the frame of mind during a period that you may not, you just can't write for the time being and, and you find it incredibly difficult. And it's it's interesting finding that you are in a situation where you can say, yes, I can write this. I know it's going to just suddenly flow out. And it's interesting how those moments change all the time. And it's quite fluid, that process, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, exactly. I, I mean, as I said, I either, I either will write on a computer, or I will write in notebooks. Um, if I, so if something suddenly occurs to me, you know, so I might be halfway through writing a piece and it's not flowing because there's a bit missing, yeah, to to bridge two aspects or whatever, or or there's a, a point you want to make that you've previously forgotten. I will. I have a you know a notebook sitting here in the office. I've got another one on my bedside table, and it's in that I will you know if I want to get that something down quickly, I won't reach for an iPad or fire up the computer. It's the old-fashioned way in the notebook, and I still think that's the best way of collecting thoughts because then 
the one thing that um, I I can't get any peace is when there's an idea bouncing around in my head and I haven't committed it to something. It's 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 all it's the fear of forgetting it. Yeah. Something suddenly comes to you. You can either write it down, preferably write it down, because even with today's technology, that's still for me the quickest way: pen and a piece of paper. Scribble it down. You've got it done. It's in your notebook, and you know it's in your notebook. So when you come back to the computer and write, then it's a you know look through the notebook. So I have a habit of everything that goes in the notebook, it stays there, and when I use it, I put a line through it. Yeah. So I can flick back through my notebook and all the pages that are, of, that have content and material I've used are scored out. The ones I haven't scored out, I'll look at again. And it's the same for fly designs. They're all in a notebook. You know, there's a sketch with a hook, arrows pointing to bits of it. Material X goes here, material Y goes here. And then I'll look at it again and I'll think, yeah, that's a good idea, but how are you going to tie that? Because something's in the wrong order. And sometimes you get to the bench put the hook in the vise, tie on the first material you thought was going to go, and then oh, it's not physically possible to get the thread in there to tie something in. And I did, I did a, uh, a pattern. I haven't, I haven't done a video of it. It's called the Tufted Midge. And basically what I did there was, was have a thorax cover of, of organza and thread the polyfiber wing through it with a needle on a loop. And then you basically cut the end of the loop and tie the ends in. I wanted to do this. So the the wing comes out backwards like a, a conventional wing. I wanted to do an emerger version where the wing points forward over the eye. You can't do it because it's going the wrong way and you can't get the thread in because the wing is already through the thorax cover, which you folded over. So you can't tie in the butts of the wing. So it's an impossible fly to make. But it, when you've got it, we used in in work. We used to call it works on paper. So a lot of people could say, "Here's a great invention," and you'd look at it and think, "Yeah, works on paper." But that X and Y component won't work together. So it's the same in fly tying. So a fair proportion of ideas fail at that stage. They work on paper in the notebook. You cannot physically tie them. Um, I have other designs which I try, but I can't physically tie them, but that's the limit of my abilities. You know, somebody with a lot more dexterity in their fingers, um, uh, somebody like David McPhail, who seems to have three hands, um, could probably do them. Um, and also my eyesight wouldn't let me tie anything lower than a 16 these days. Yeah. <laughs> Right, what we're going to do is move on to your fishing a little bit, um, but I wanted to just, if people having listened to this, um, organza um, as a material, um, I guess haberdashers and stuff like that, and I, I guess is it, I assume it's pretty cheap as a time material as well. It's extremely cheap, yeah. Um, I, I tend to use um, basically... Yeah, haberdashers online, the the big retailer that starts with an A online, eBay, whatever. Um, yeah, but I get you get fifty meters for four quid, and since you use I don't know ten centimeters a fly, and and you don't use all the ribbon. So if you if you cut ten, so you can cut you can tie you know quite a complex fly with ten centimeters of ribbon. Because you're cutting the edge off, pulling the fibers out, using them for tails, using the hull for a body, and then using the hull for a thorax, and then using a bit of the unstripped ribbon for a thorax cover. So that's, I think, in, in fly couture, um, I, I'm guessing because I haven't seen it in print yet, there was, there was a couple of organza patterns in there, one of which is a buzzer tied entirely with organza. Um, and so basically, that's that's using two colours, black and orange, but in three or four different techniques in one fly. Mm. So yeah, it's compared. Let's say compared to uh, conventional fly tying techniques uh, materials, yes, it's extremely expensive. So if you, if you tie a uh, an organza fly 
the most expensive component is going to be the hook. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's really easy to work with for a beginner too. Um, cause you can't really go wrong. And it's, it, if you make a mistake, you just unwind it. You're not, you, one thing, you are not going to break it. Um, like a hackle, yeah. uh, or a hurl, you know, or a, or a, you know, a strip quill or any of those other materials. Um, you don't need to learn how to dub properly. The only thing you need to do is, is be able to make tight thread wraps and finish the head neatly. And even if you don't do that, the fish aren't going to care. If it's got if it's got bits sticking out of the head, they'll probably like it. Yeah, <laughs> nature's never perfect, no. is it? No. Right. So let's move on to your fishing. We we talked a little bit, and you've you've alluded to you know that you like to fish the duo setup a lot of the time. Is that your preferred? Are you feel you're searching it? I know you um, you're a nymph as well, and we touched on streamer fishing as well. What is it for you? Is that that your preferred sort of? I get to the river. That's my searching setup. That's how you like to fish. Um, yeah. Well, this time of year, certainly, probably from May through to September. If, if, the, if the river conditions are suitable, that's what I'll fish. Um, but I'm, so I'm basically, so people can understand, I'm, I'm fishing a dry fly usually a size 14 and the dry fly is tied on a jig hook. And the reason for that is that I can then tie my nymph length to the eye of the jig hook. And if I want to change the depth, I just snip off that link at the dry fly and change it for a longer or shorter one, which I've got in my pack. So it, it's extremely quick as a, you know, as opposed to other methods for changing the depth. Um, I, yeah, that's what I will fish from preference. If, if there is a, I'll have the dry fly is a pattern, simple pattern, but it's one that will work as a dry fly alone. Um, so if there is a rise on, or if I am getting fish coming to the indicator fly rather than the nymph, then I'll cut the, the, the nymph off and just fish the dry. But mostly I'm fishing the dewer. Um, and it's probably, yeah, it's the most pleasurable aspect because you get to do more casting than you do. Well, even, even, so the basic, the three basic methods I use most are fishing the duo. So that's on a, my favorite rod, which is an eight and a half foot three weight. Um, and you know, on the TAF, sometimes you're casting very short. Maybe you're casting, I don't know, 15 yards, but. No more than that, but that's rare. It's mostly close in. So fishing the duo is is good. Um, if I'm not having any success with that, I'll put two nymphs on, but still light enough nymphs that I can cast them properly. And then once it comes to September or autumn, then I'll change to a, a eleven foot three weight year nymph line. And then basically as the season progresses into the winter, the bugs, <clears throat> the bugs on the end just get heavier. Um, so we're going from, you know, two and a half mil bugs in the summer to four and a half mil, five mil in, in the winter. But I typically, if I'm urinimphing, I'll have, uh, my favorite would be to fish with a four or 4.7 on the point. And then I like to fish an unweighted dropper just so it can move around a bit more. Um, and so that that's basically the three techniques I use. Duo, two nymphs on a conventional fly line, and then a euro nymph flying. Or occasionally in the winter I'll use, um, I used to exclusively use a braid line instead of euro nymph. Um, the braid line's more sensitive. You could literally feel everything, um, but it is, it's a real pain if you lose a fish or a fish comes off and the line springs back and it just automatically wraps itself around the rod tip. And wet braid is a nightmare to unpick. So at least with a, 
a urinate flying, it's like untangling a fly line or just usually just flick the rod tip and the loops come off. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's the, the, kind of the great thing around, the, you know, about fishing the taff. You can fish those different techniques on different bits of water th- right through the year. Um, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to change the stretch of river that I'm fishing between summer trout on a dry fly and winter grayling on a heavy bug. I'm just fishing the same stretch, but with more water in it mm. and, and different clothes on, obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about, you did the six of the best. I know what your, I think your eight and a half foot rod is because you mentioned that in your six of the best. Yeah. Tell us about your famous granola bars that you make as well. Oh. Cause you mentioned, homemade ones yeah the chocolate granola bars yeah yeah good extremely complicated to make i'm afraid <laughs> uh yeah you basically get a glass bowl you dump half a bag of oats in there a load of nuts um sesame seeds basically whatever ever in the cupboard toasted hazelnut seeds are an essential and then a lot of cocoa powder because i like chocolate um some melted butter. Uh, what else? Oh, a touch of golden syrup. They're not very sweet at all. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, a di- I'm a diabetic, so they, they shouldn't be. Um, yeah, so basically, oh, shove, yeah, you can either put melted butter in or just a big lump of butter in it and shove it in the microwave till it melts. Stir it all around, spread it out on a baking tray, 180 degrees for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Cut it while it's still a bit warm and then let it set. And then it does set hard, pretty hard. So you can put it in a put it in a plastic bag, put it in your vest or your sling pack, and it doesn't fall apart. So yeah, on a on a winter day, nice bit of oats and nuts. So it's long sustaining carbs. Mm. Um and you can eat it with gloves on. You can eat it with your still out of the, the wrapper that it's in. If you've had your hands in the taff, which is generally what you try and do, um, yeah, it's it's my go-to fish food. Good, I like the sound of that. Um, tell me something. How do you think fishing feels to you right now? The state of fishing, and um, how does it feel? Um, I think it's evolving. I mean, if, if you look at, I mean, if you look at how fishing is now compared to when I started, you know, it's a lot more. I think it's a lot more complicated, or appears a lot more complicated for somebody wanting to learn. I think if you look at fly fishing, particularly, I think the the demographics and the age range are shifting. I'm not sure that we have people coming in at the younger end of the the market, as it were. Um, I think, I mean, you know, when I was learning, just when I was learning fly fishing, there were maybe a couple of magazines, I guess, or you could get a book from the library. Now, if you want information, you know, maybe the problem is there's more information out there than you than a somebody could deal with um which okay if if you uh if you take your time and watch the right youtube videos i suppose you could you could learn everything you want to learn or uh, hopefully you would have somebody you know a parent or relative or somebody that could show you i mean when when i learned i don't want to learn to fish i teach myself because Basically, my father came home with a rod and a reel and Abu catalogue, and the Abu catalogue had knot pictures in it, and that's how I learned to tie knots. He and I used to go fishing for years. He never learned to tie a knot. He, if he wanted a toby or a hook tied on, I did it for him. But that, again, I think it was not just the way my brain worked. He, his, his brain was very similar. He was a car designer. And he always had to have a, a, a home project, which is why we ended up with a boat, um, because he wanted something, you know, something new to learn how to do. Um, I used to have some of those um, 
I'm digressing a bit, but some of those fishing trips that I used to take in my late teens and early 20s, those were interesting because they used to bring home prototype cars. Wow. Uh, so they, they were cars that were um, basically that they were trying out. So I remember one time I was up in Torridon. He'd lent me this um, Hillman Avenger that had a souped-up engine, and they converted it to some form of four-wheel drive. It was it was designed to be a, a – well, it was, actually. They tried it as a rally car. So I was driving in Torridon um, on single-track roads, as they have up there. Back in, back in the day, they were all single-track roads. And the, uh, the throttle cable – or the spring on the throttle, something went. So it basically went from low revs to full revs as I was going around a bend next to a lock wow. on a single track road. Wow. Uh, yeah, so it nearly killed me. I, the only thing I could do was turn the engine off. But yeah, so a lot, a lot of the trips I did when I was young were adventure trips in Scotland, either on, you know, on the train, um, you know, going up to Loch Ossian or further north with a rucksack on my back, fly rod and a fly tube, and enough food for a week with a proviso that the rest of the food would be tracked. That's what I did. Um, you know, no phone, no GPS. I had a map and a compass, but that was it. Um, I don't know if people still do that these days. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 different times, and I know you know in fishing in general, you know carp, I know the popularity of carp fishing. I can't understand that, you know, and I can understand the commerciality of it in terms of wanting to sell baits and bivy chairs and bivy tents and the latest. But I can't. I hopefully people do it and get peace. It out of fishing as they should do, but you know, sitting in a bivy with three rods and three bite alarms, doing nothing for hours and hours, doesn't doesn't appeal. But I think that's it's sad in a way because I think that's not the essence of fishing. You know, we were discussing before that fishing's not about catching fish, carp angling. It is. It's a very efficient, very inefficient way of catching carp, in my opinion. Whereas a fly rod is a very efficient way of catching carp and big carp. Mm. Uh, the, there's a lake near here, uh, about three miles up the road. Used to be, it's a lovely lake. Used to be a trout lake, um, but it was like lots of trout lake. It's gone over to carp in this instance, and they now allow bait fishermen. So the, the me and a couple of carp, other anglers who used to go up there and fish trout, we used to go up there in, in the summer because they used to stop. They used to stop stocking it in the summer, but there were wild carp in there from ornamental carp. So in, in the summer, we go up and fish for those. And now it's it's a carp lake that allows bait fishing, but also you can still fly fishing. And I know Jason, a mate of mine, still goes up there fly fishing, and he, he, he posted yesterday that there were eight carp anglers sat on the bank fishing bait, catching nothing, and he was catching fish off the top on an outcare caddis all day long. And I've, I've done the same thing on, on my some of my the club I belong to, some of the carp lakes. People would sit there, and they're not catching fish. But I don't think they're there not to catch fish. They are there to catch fish. They're just not catching fish, and therefore that defeats the object. So if mm. you're out not to catch fish, and catching fish is a bonus, which is kind of how I view fishing the taff, then that's great. But if you're out to catch fish and not catching fish, can't you? Yeah, you know, doesn't doesn't seem right to me. Mm, mm. I don't know. I see carp fishing, and I don't do it. So you know, with a fly rod from time to time. But to me, part of that aspect of it, I see it is the escape is is sitting down in your bivy or whatever it is, relaxing that way, and. I hoped it would be seen as that fish would be the byproduct because you can find peace, you can find your escape. Where it might be for us wading a river or whatever it is, it may be in a different way. I don't know. I, yeah. I suppose it, 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 it's different strokes for different folks. Um, it's interesting the 
thinking about where fishing is and i've said on this before and i'll continue to that i think there's some wonderful stuff being done within schools to make kids aware of fishing and their the fish's environment and everything else which is applauded i think probably what happens is that there are so many other things for kids to do now that they're not doing them in the same way that they were that it might be football cricket fishing whatever it is rugby whatever there are lots of other different pastimes to take up some of that slack now whereas for me that's all it was really um and then they rediscover fishing again a little bit later and for me from a guiding when i was a guide that we would find people from their 30s upwards who wanted to learn how to fly fish they wanted to get out into the outdoors so for me that's where that growth area is coming and the learning from it is you know and i think i've said again with the casting aspect now latterly not guiding or instructing but i was finding so many people were coming along who'd looked at youtube and learned how to cast that way and it was actually really quite good and so technology and i think things like social media and i have a not a love hate with it but sometimes i sort of bang my head on a wall with it but what it's doing is promoting fishing in a really cool way be it carp fishing but obviously i look at fly fishing and you see so many people appear to be out there doing it and enjoying it whether it be on a still water be it casting flies as you said with your friend for carp and it's a good way to highlight the good stuff that's going out there and and to me it feels as though there are more people doing it but they're a little bit older so it may not be kids as such there are kids out there doing that obviously but they're coming to it in their 20s to 30s and want to go out doing similar to what you talked about in your first article and what you said about a, a your backpack and a rod and you you know wanted to travel and get out on the outside i think there's more of that around now and also given the environment we've had that lockdown environment that people will want to get out when it's safe to do so properly so to get out into the outdoors and experience nature just that little bit more yeah well it it's like um as i said there's a lot more people on the river now and they they're there because and and i know that you know they're people that I've never seen before. And the amount of time I fish down there, if I've never seen them before, they haven't been there before. Um, and, yeah, they are um, just couples or people on their own out for a walk because it's accessible to them. And I'm sure because I've, I've come across lots of people who are lost because um, it, there are lots of paths that go off the main paths. Um, and They've gone down. They've gone down a, a small path, and they're not being able to get out or find their way back. Um, yeah, they're they're hopefully the, those people are getting a value from that resource because it is a it is a you know it's it's an urban river. It, you know, it's got a railway line on one side. It's crossed by a railway bridge. It's got cricket pitches and rugby pitches, and all of those other city resources which aren't being used because they can't be at the moment um but in amongst that you know there, there's beautiful woodland loads of uh you know, different plants and trees quiet stretches of river that you can sit in the shade or sit in the sun and there's a lot of people doing that um and i i'd like to see people you know getting outdoors for whatever reasons um and I, there are a lot of kids there with parents because they're not in school and their parents got to get them out, which is good that they're actually getting them out of the house. And hopefully maybe some of those will see a river as something different. It's not something that you just see from a car or a train window. It does have – it has a smell. It has a sound. And it has the sound of the running water. It has the sound of the wind through the trees and so on. And even though it is a an urban river and, you know, best will in the world, it has got the old shopping trolley and the old traffic cone, 
dotted around the place, but it is, it is as I, you know, as I try and show in my videos, it is a beautiful place, even though, you know, you only have to walk 100 yards off in one direction and cross a railway line or their houses or, or whatever. Um, and while, yeah, beauty, I think beauty and wildness is where you find it or where you look for it. It's not, you know, it's, it kind of, it kind of exasperates me a bit because, you know, I can understand it, you know, during lockdown when they lift lockdown, then everybody flocks to the same place. You know, all the crowds that you see on the Dirtle Door or somewhere like that. I mean, I can understand people wanting to do that, but it's because they don't have their own local special place that they can go to, and everybody should have a local special place. Mm. Yeah, don't just need oh, well, Dirtle Door's famous, so everybody goes to Dirtle Door because it's a a natural beauty spot. Yeah, I've seen it once. I wouldn't, you know, but there are lots of equally beautiful places in Britain, and the. No, within short distance, and everybody, I think, should have their own place. You've got your home water, I've got mine. And as I think we've both alluded to, if that was all we could ever fish, then that would be okay. Um, which bring, yeah, brings me on to my next question, funnily enough, dream destination, which I think we can put a, a cross through, can't we? Uh, um, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much, um, Take that as the TAF and possibly Iceland. Um, Hall of Fame piece of tackle, what's that? Um, my loop rod. Big, yeah. It, it's just, I I miss it in the winter. I can't, you know, eight and a half foot three weight, you can't cast a urine in flying on it. So, yeah, that would be it. It's I, So basically, I use three rods. I use a, a 11 foot three weight, a nine and a half three weight, and the loop. Um, the loop I will fish now till September. Then I'll go to the nine and a half, and then I'll go to the 11. Um, it, it's just a pleasure to use. It's, yeah, it's just an extension of my arm. Um, I, I don't have to think about using it. That's the main thing. Perfect. It's amazing, Nick. We've spoken for nearly an hour and a half oh, and gee. off all over the place. <laughs> uh, it's been great, and, and um, I think it's been fascinating to listen um, to your thoughts on fishing, tying, and everything else. You've we've talked about the videos. Um, where can people find you if they want to look at your tying videos or your? And I would recommend them, and, and particularly the ones of your fishing your home river. Where where can people find those? So my, my YouTube channel is just called Nick Thomas, but if, if you Google Nick Thomas fly tying or search YouTube that way, there's also a, I've got a, a portfolio, well, a, a web page which has pictures of all my flies and links to each, the ones that have tying videos that have links to. So um, I can send you the link to that if you like, and maybe you could, you could put that underneath the podcast. But that's probably the easiest. The, that's the uh, the one click finding it. Perfect. I shall do that. Well, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you again for your supporting of um, fly culture. And before that, with Eat Sleep Fish as well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I thoroughly enjoy um, reading your articles as well. And it looks really, really good. Yours, as I said, should be turning up today or perhaps tomorrow um but it looks fantastic and it will be a really good read so i know our readers will enjoy that so thank you for that um we need to fish at some stage i know we've talked about it and um, many many times <laughs> and probably a function of us both loving her not wanting to leave our home waters more possibly anything. But hopefully we can organise that before um, too long. So thank you for being a guest on the podcast today. I've really enjoyed um, talking to you. So thank you for that, Nick. It's been great having you along. Thanks. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the very latest Fly Culture podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. We've got many more to come for you, so keep tuning in. And um, if you've enjoyed the magazine as well, let us know. Um, if you have any questions, you 
may have heard the one I did with Nick about answering reader questions. So please um, drop us some questions if you'd like, and I'll be very happy to help with those. And um, thank you for all the nice comments as well. It's so I always reply to them and thank you to everyone for saying they're enjoying the podcast as well. I'm enjoying doing them. So we'll keep doing those as well. So thanks very much indeed for listening to the fly culture podcast. The fly culture podcast is brought to you in association with fly culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find fly culture on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.